Electrolysis is easy. Well, the basics are easy anyway. The only tricky bit is remembering a few rules depending on what's being electrolyzed. What is electrolysis? Well, in simple terms, it's just using electricity to cause a reaction. You need a power supply or a battery. It must be DC, direct current. This is connected to two electrodes, two pieces of graphite, that's carbon, or a metal. They're inserted into an electrolyte, a solution, that's water with an ionic compound dissolved in it. We call the electrode attached to the negative terminal of the battery the cathode, and the one attached to the positive terminal the anode. Now what's funny is that there are some contexts in which these names can be swapped legitimately. It's a bit complicated, but you can rest assured that for GCSE science, these are definitely the right way round. The negative electrode is the cathode, the positive electrode is the anode. Now it might look like we don't have a complete circuit, but we need to remember that electricity is the flow of any charge, not just electrons in wires. And what do we know any solution contains? Ions, atoms that have a charge, and they're free to move in solution. What happens once you connect the battery or turn on the power supply will depend on what the electrodes are made from and what electrolytes you have. So let's look at the first classic example involving carbon electrodes and a salt solution. Let's say the salt is sodium chloride. Our electrolyte is sodium chloride solution. Carbon rod electrodes are inert, which means they won't change or react during the process. That's why we use them in this case. Next, let's look at the solution. Any solution is a result of an ionic compound being dissolved in water. The ions partially dissociate, we say. We now have a soup, as it were, a mixture of these ions. Yes, Na plus and Cl minus, because those are the sodium and chloride ions. But it's also true for the water. It dissociates into ions too, H plus and OH minus. These ions are always present in any solution. Now you know that when it comes to electrical charge, opposites attract. Positive ions will be attracted to the cathode, which is negative. That's why we call such ions cations. Na plus and H plus are the cations we have here. Negative ions are called anions, as they're attracted to the anode, which is positive. You might find it helpful to remember which way round these are by thinking about cats, which can be nice creatures sometimes. Cations are positive or positive. Cations are positive, which means they're missing electrons. So when they get to the cathode, they're meeting an electrode that has electrons that it's willing to give away. If cations gain electrons, they become neutral and turn back into atoms. If you remember oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain of electrons. We can say that cations are always reduced at the cathode. Reduction always happens there. The opposite is true at the anode. Anions have extra electrons, which the anode, which is positive, can accept from them. Anions are therefore oxidized at the electrode. They give their extra electrons to the anode. These can result in a metal coating the electrode or bubbles of gas being produced as the ions turn back into atoms. But there's an issue. Only one type of cation can be reduced to the cathode and similar for the anode. This is potentially the trickiest bit about electrolysis, remembering what the rules are that determine what will be produced at each electrode. And it's all to do with reactivity. Here's the first rule that you need to remember. At the cathode, the less reactive cation will be reduced and the more reactive cation will stay in solution. So let's look at our reactivity series. We can see that hydrogen is less reactive than sodium, which means that hydrogen will be reduced while the sodium ions stay in solution. We can write a half or ionic equation for what's happening. H plus plus E minus, that's the electron it picks up from the cathode, makes just H. The issue is, is that hydrogen atoms can't exist on their own, so they pair up to make H2, hydrogen gas. So all we have to do is double up the ions and electrons too. As you can see, there are lots of metals more reactive than hydrogen, so we often get hydrogen gas produced when we electrolyze a salt solution. So the rule can be simplified. Hydrogen is produced at the cathode if the metal is more reactive. If not, the metal is reduced instead, which will coat the carbon electrode, the cathode. The second rule to do with what happens at the anode is a bit trickier again. In short, if the anion in solution is a halide ion, that's fluoride, chloride, bromide or iodide, they're oxidized at the anode. They lose an electron each to turn into atoms. The half or ionic equation looks like this. Note that we put the electron on the other side. We should never really put take away, subtract an electron in an equation. Similar to hydrogen, halogen gases are diatomic, two atoms, so they go around in pairs. This then leaves the OH- ions in solution. If the anion is anything other than a halide ion, say sulfate, nitrate or whatever, it stays in solution, and oxygen gas is produced at the anode instead. 
It's extremely unlikely that you'll be expected to know the half equation for what's happening here, but here it is anyway. 4OH minus goes to O2 plus 2H2O plus 4 electrons. In the case of our sodium chloride solution, that leaves the Na plus and OH minus ions in solution. So we've actually made sodium hydroxide solution. And that's all there is to the electrolysis of solutions. Try and use these rules to predict what will happen in another classic example, the electrolysis of copper sulfate solution. Pause the video and see if you can figure out what will be produced at each electrode, the half equations, and what solution is produced as a result. Here's the answer. Let's use our rule about cations. Copper is less reactive than hydrogen, so it's reduced to the cathode. Copper atoms don't go around in a certain number, so it's just Cu2 plus gaining two electrons each, leaving H plus in solution. We should therefore see a coating of copper appear on the outside of the carbon cathode. We don't have any halide ions in the solution, so it's oxygen that will be oxidized at the anode, so we should see bubbles leaving the sulfate ions in solution. So we've got H plus and SO40 minus ions left in solution. Balancing the charges on this gives us H2 SO4, which you should hopefully know is the formula for sulfuric acid. Well done if you got that right. What's interesting is that if you just electrolyze pure water, the H plus and OH minus ions aren't competing with anything else, so they have to be reduced and oxidized, making hydrogen gas at the cathode and oxygen gas at the anode. This is the most common method of making these gases. Don't forget that you can test for what gas is produced from electrolysis using the standard gas tests. Watch my video on that if you don't know these yet. Ions are free to move when an ionic compound is dissolved in solution, but they're also free to move if the ionic compound is molten too. No water is needed. This can be used to obtain pure metal from its compound, like aluminium from aluminium oxide, which is found in the ore bauxite. Similar to electrolyzing just water, the ions aren't competing with anything else, so the cations are reduced at the cathode and the anions are oxidized at the anode. In this specific case, that results in pure aluminium coating the cathode, while oxygen is made at the anode. This requires a lot of energy, not least because you need to melt the compound first, that's why sometimes another substance will be added to reduce the melting point. In this case, that's something called cryolite. Can you give the half equations for what's happening at each electrode here? Pause the video and have a go. And here they are. Unfortunately, in this case, while fairly inert, the carbon anodes will react with the oxygen, which means they need to be replaced over time. There's one more thing that electrolysis can be used for, purifying impure metals. Copper being the most common example we come across. If you have a lump of copper which has impurities in it, what can you do? You make it the anode. The cathode ideally will be a bit of pure copper you already have. The electrolyte will be a solution of copper sulfate, so no other ions are involved. And we know the H plus ions from the water are more reactive, so they won't be reduced. First, the copper atoms in the anode lose electrons to become Cu2 plus ions. They're oxidized and they enter the solution. This cannot be true for any impurities though, so they just remain solid. As the mass of the copper anode decreases, impurities merely sink to the bottom of the vessel, likely a beaker if you're doing this in a school lab. Copper ions are then attracted to the cathode, where they're reduced and turn back into copper atoms. So you see the mass of the cathode increase as pure copper is deposited onto it. Clever, right? So I hope you found this helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. Check out the channel for more, including videos going through whole papers. See you next time.